I wrote a book called Explanations and Corrections in the Gospel of Luke. And one of the chapters is called Daniel 9.27 did not refer to King Manasseh of Judah. An article I quoted above said that the said that Bible scholars agree that the abomination of desolation is a noddle in some sense. And a couple of reference works show that some rabbis thought that the expression abomination of desolation referred to Manasseh's setting up an abominable image in the house of God, according to Second Chronicles 33, 7. And not just rabbis, but quite a number of Christians in explaining the book of Daniel uh, think that the abomination of, of desolation ultimately referred back to Manasseh. For example, a, a Christian author named John Dale, writing in London in 1807 in a book with a very long title, uh, first he quoted from Daniel 12, 11 through 12, which contains the expression of abomination that maketh desolate. And then he says his own words or his own comments on that are, what is meant is the time that the daily sacrifice was taken away by Manasseh, king of Judah. So he thinks that Daniel 12, 11 through 12 is a reference to Manasseh. And there are other Christian um, <clears throat> expositors or commentators who think the same thing. King Manasseh really did set up an abominable idol, which could be called an abomination as in Deuteronomy 29:17 his act really did lead to the desolation of the kingdom of Judah verses 4 5 and 7 of 2 Kings 21 say in the American Standard Version and he built altars in the house of Jehovah whereof Jehovah said in Jerusalem will I put my name. And he put altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of Jehovah. And he set the graven image of Asherah that he had made in the house of which Jehovah said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. And to point out the attractiveness of this theory, if you're reading Matthew 24, 17, 24, 15, uh, you can easily read that event into the words. When therefore you see the abomination of desolation, sounds like a noddle that causes desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Well, an idol can be set up, and you say that it's standing. And the holy place sounds like it means either the holy place of the temple or the entire temple. In fact, it's easier, taking this verse alone, to read the uh, Manasseh theory into that verse than to read Luke's uh, interpretation of that verse. So I wrote in the book so you could accurately say that Manasseh set up an abomination causing desolation in the holy place. And you could truthfully say that an abomination of desolation was standing in the holy place if you wanted to make this passage sound like the passages under discussion in Mark, Matthew, and Daniel. But Luke thought that the abomination of desolation was armies, not idols. He thought that standing in the holy place, or where it ought not, meant armies compassing or surrounding Jerusalem. Another distinction is that Luke said that the abomination stood in an active sense under its own power like a living creature. 
It didn't stand like a lifeless object which is acted upon like a noddle that is set up. It's a confusing oddity of language that such a lifeless oddle can also be said to stand, meaning merely that it remains where it is placed until it falls. Luke explained the holy place as the environs of Jerusalem, the area that a besieging army would occupy while compassing or encircling it, not the two courts of the house of Jehovah. The Manasseh theory appeared in a Christian magazine in 1878. In the early years of his reign, BC 698 to 643, Manasseh had no regard for holy places or things. Prior to his captivity, where he repented of his sin, he sought to undo the reforms of his father. He built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He set up a graven image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God. 2 Kings 21, 4-7, 2 Chronicles 33, 7. This may have given rise to Daniel's expression, abomination that maketh desolate, in whose mind the memory of the sanctuary that is desolate was ever present as the type of the desolation of the restored temples. And I'm highlighting this because it couldn't possibly, what has, uh, Manasseh did couldn't possibly have really been the type of those desolations. Daniel 9, 17, 24, 26, 27, and 12, 11. From Daniel comes the New Testament phrase, abomination of Daniel, desolation, Matthew 24, 15, Mark 13, 14, connected by our Savior with the final overthrow of the restored edifice. The theory that the abomination of desolation was the idol set up by Manasseh is far more harmonious with Deuteronomy than the theory that it was an idol or altar set up by Antiochus. Manasseh was king of Judah and Deuteronomy 28 through 29 warned the Israelites that if they worshiped abominable idols, they would be cursed, Deuteronomy 29, 17 through 28. In contrast, Antiochus was not a Jew or a king of Israel. The fact that he was able to defile the temple shows that God had already forsaken and cursed the Israelites. Jehovah smote the Judeans and set a strange nation over them, a nation speaking a foreign language and making the Judeans serve gods of wood and stone. Deuteronomy 28, 15, 25, 36, and 49. God never said that he would punish Israel if a pagan king set up a idol in the temple by force and against the will of the Israelites. Unlike the so-called Maccabean theory of the abomination of desolation of Daniel, the Manasseh theory is reasonable. However, according to Luke, Jesus didn't believe it. And by reasonable, I mean scriptural, but it's kind of impossible to have had a literal fulfillment because, as I made reference to, there's no way that Antiochus Epiphanes could be an anti-type of Manasseh, the king of Israel, and the uh, there was no exile of the Jews after Antiochus did that. And this thing about, these words about Jehovah smote the Judeans and set a strange nation over them, a nation speaking a foreign language and making the Judeans serve gods of wood and stone. That proves that the Jews were in a cursed condition then. Otherwise, uh, Greeks would not be in the Holy Land, but rather the, uh, uh, the Jews would have had their own army and been able to defend themselves and would easily have kept the Greeks out by divine intervention. So I continued to write. The Hebrew scriptures had prophesied that idolatry would lead to curses, including the desolation of Israel. For example, Deuteronomy 29.17 seems to use abominations as a synonym for idols. And ye have seen their abominations in their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, 
which were among them. Then Deuteronomy 29, 24 through 28 gives idolatry as the reason that God would destroy Israel and send the Israelites into captivity. Even all the nations shall say, Wherefore hath Jehovah done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat, the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, Because they forsook the covenant of Jehovah, the God of their fathers, which he made with them, when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, and went and served other gods, and worshipped them, gods that they knew not, and that he had not given unto them. Therefore the anger of Jehovah was kindled against this land, to bring, to bring upon it all the curse that is written in this book. And Jehovah rooted them out of their land in anger, and in wrath, and in great indignation, and cast them into another land, as at this day. So the worship of abominations, abominable idols, was legal justification to exile Israel. This actually happened to Israel when the ten-tribe kingdom of Israel was exiled by the Assyrians, and when the two-tribe kingdom was exiled by the Babylonians. Jeremiah blamed the exile of Judah on Manasseh, and I will cause them to be tossed to and fro among all the kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. If Manasseh set up the abomination of desolation, then the abomination didn't perform desolation. The use of the idol was to be punished by desolation. The idol brought a curse along with it. Idolatry was a crime. God knew about the crime, and God motivated his agents to perform desolation as a penalty. But according to Luke, Jesus thought the abomination of desolation mentioned by Daniel the prophet was armies, not idols. Luke 21, 20 substitutes armies for the abomination of desolation in Matthew and Mark and describes the desolation done by the armies in verses 21 through 24. So Luke didn't agree with the theory I quoted above that the abomination was a sin that was to be punished by desolation. It was an abominable Gentile army that desolated Jerusalem, and elsewhere Luke explains that the army desolated Jerusalem not because of idolatry, but because of the murder of the prophets. So I mentioned that Antiochus Epiphanes couldn't possibly be an anti-type of Manasseh. But the, uh, the 70 AD destruction of the temple likewise was not an anti-type. Uh, Israel didn't even have a king at that time. Uh, to do what Manasseh did. The Jews were not committing idolatry. Rome, Rome controlled Judah. Judah didn't have an independent army. So they weren't in a blessed condition, so to speak, like the Israelites under the reign of Manasseh. And the, uh, and the temple was destroyed and Judea went into exile which is a perfect match with which would happen with what happened under Manasseh. However, uh, uh, the situation as a whole could not be an anti-type since the Jews weren't committing idolatry and they didn't even have a king and they were under the control of the Romans already. And I uh, mentioned that Although the, uh, there are things to be said for the Manasseh theory, I could have called the chapter Daniel 9, 27, 11, 31, and 12, 11 did not refer to King Manasseh. They all refer to armies. But uh, I explain how uh, Daniel 11, 31, and 12, 11 refer to armies in another chapter.